Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. Archaeology is coming to 1.20 and with it comes a new emphasis on ruins, but how do players build their own ruins in Minecraft? What makes them look realistic? As an archaeologist, I have spent a lot of time in and around ruins, so here are some tips and tricks for building your own in Minecraft. First things first, since we're in Minecraft, I want to highlight something really important. Chances are, if you're trying to build your own ruins, you have a story in mind that you want to tell. In reality, archaeological sites or ruins usually decay without any real regard for preserving the story of the place or the site. Archaeology is all about trying to figure out those stories, and with many sites, we only find out a fraction of it. But in Minecraft, you get to decide what gets preserved. You decide what stories get told. So you might have a story in mind already, or you might be making it up as you go. I'm going to be making it up as I go just because my brain works a little bit better that way, but as we go through these tips, keep those stories in mind and let them help you make decisions. So let's start with tip number one, and this is like the first question that you kind of want to ask yourself here. Why are people here? Why did they come here in the first place? I'm sure that seems a bit simple, but what made them want to build a site here? Is there part of the landscape that they're interested in? Does it have good natural resources that they can use? Is it maybe easier to defend or gives a good view of the surrounding area? Is it at a crossroads so trade would be really profitable here? Like why? Why have people decided to build something here? For this site, I'm going to say that there was this unusual tree, basically a massive azalea tree, and that was important to these people. We could say that the tree is sacred, or we could just leave it at the tree holding a lot of meaning for these people. The meaning behind the tree isn't terribly important for my story, so I'm not going to focus on it terribly much, but hopefully you can see how the details of your story can help you focus in on certain details in these ruins and things that you're not as concerned about you don't have to work it out. Now that the tree is built, we can move to the first real phase of this process, right? Building the site to what it once was. That probably sounds a bit odd, but building the site up and then destroying it in a planned way will help you really get the ruins that you're trying to build. This leads us into tip number two. Build the structures that came first. We've got the tree, so what would people do here? What would the human activity look like? Are there any buildings? Is this a place that people travel to? Who visits? And how many people from how many different cultures? What materials did they have access to while building this site? I'm thinking that initially, like very at the very beginning, my tree here will get some people from farther away traveling out to see it. So someone would have built up a small inn here. It's not much at first, maybe a couple of rooms plus a small space for the innkeeper. So this is not a very big build. This is like the first stage of what this site was. Hopefully you can see how this starts to shape what you're going to do here, right? If your site is a house, then you'll probably have a lot of use from whoever lived there and maybe not so much use from people living further away. But if the ruins are part of a village, then you'll have a few houses. If your ruin is a cemetery, then you'll have a lot of graves or markers to honor the people who are buried there. But don't build your building up to what it looked like at its height. Not just yet. Start with an early phase like my smaller inn here. My plan is for this to eventually be a bit bigger, but I'm building this first so that this earlier phase can still appear in the final ruins. Tip number three is build some infrastructure. Your ruin didn't exist in a vacuum. There were probably roads and pathways out to it, other buildings nearby, or places for people to park their wagon or tie up their horses or even spend the night in the area if your building isn't a house or an inn or something. Thing. What else might be ruined around here that would have been necessary for this ruin to have been a useful place to go in the past? How would you get here? Is there a road? Where did the road go? And what about a water source or food? Are there any communal buildings like a market or a town hall or something? What would those be made out of and how often might they be maintained? For my tree and the inn next to it, there absolutely needs to be a road out here, but I'm thinking it's nothing super fancy in the beginning, probably just some dirt and mud and such. They also need a well, because we are on a bit of a hill and carrying water up that every single day would be really, really annoying. <laughs> There would also need to be a path to the tree, right? Because that's why people are here to begin with. And finally, there need to be a few hitching posts at the side of the inn so that visitors can at least tie up their horses while they're here. And now we're on to tip number four. Build up the site to what you think it looked like during its most popular or most successful period. When this site was hopping, 
what did it look like? The reason that we don't do this until now is because there are parts of that original build that may still come through to our new build. See how I've preserved the original roof line here? This isn't exactly how we see it in reality, it's usually like bits that are sticking off of the wall, but there are loads of sites, especially castles, where roofs were raised or lowered and you can still see where the previous roof was. The same goes for floors, walls, or any other type of structural evidence, so those are things that might be visible in your ruins later on. For this site, I'm thinking that they probably added another floor to the inn and moved the bedrooms upstairs. They probably also built a small house for the innkeeper who lives alone in my version of this just for ease. And then they also build a stable that can hold three animals and has a hayloft up above them. The path to the tree changes from being just before the house along the road to just after it near the well, and they added some hanging soul lanterns to the tree's decorations. We get some signs, some decoration in the area in front of the tree, a bench, and even a donations box. Inside the inn, the rooms are about the same size as before because I always build buildings smaller than I should, but the ground floor now has a couch and some tables and a reception desk. There are dressers in the bedrooms. It's a little bit more fleshed out of a build. I've switched out a lot of the materials, but you can see how the original timbers on the corners of the house stayed the same, or how most of the original road and the entire structure of the well stayed the same. Different parts of your ruin were probably built at different times, even in the same building. So it's good to have an early build phase like tip number two and a later build phase like this. Moving on to tip number five, build up where people went. This is harder to turn into a nice snappy tip that's easily quotable, but basically I want you to think about where people were in this site. Where did they walk, sit, run, cook, eat, sleep, or any other things that humans might do here? Where did people go within this site? Those areas are more likely to have things that maybe fell out of someone's pocket or something someone left unintentionally, and they're also more likely to have a lot more wear and tear on the actual materials of the site. An easy example with my site is the area in front of the tree. People might have left flowers or put donations in the donations box, or they might have left something important along the fence. Places where people go are also more likely to be cleaned regularly, but they're also more likely to get used, and people like to leave stuff where they've been. Maybe they've left trash in your ruin, or maybe it's some gold, or maybe it's something that's really valuable or sentimental to that person, but isn't terribly valuable to people today. Think about what that might be, and if any of that is potentially interesting for the story you're trying to tell, try to work it into your ruins. Tip number five actually connects to tip number six, which is forbidden zones. Like I just said, we should think about where people went, right? But we should also think about where people didn't go and why they didn't go there. It could be that people didn't do much in the area under the stairs, for example, because it's cramped and dark, or it could be that they didn't do much on the roof of buildings because they weren't exactly built with easy roof access, right? They're not going up and down there every single day. But forbidden zones can also be spaces that people at the time felt should be given respect. This area in front of the fence around the tree is going to get a lot of traffic with people leaving things, but everywhere behind that fence won't have nearly as much going on because nobody's allowed over there. Think about whether whether there are spaces in your ruin that people at the time wouldn't have gone because those areas are less likely to have stuff falling from people's pockets, for example, or they'll probably have fewer intentionally placed objects because people just aren't going into that space even if they spend a lot of time looking at it. These forbidden zones are also places that might not change all that much through the life of this ruin, at least while people are using it, simply because if people never go there, they might be less likely to worry about how that place looks to other people who are visiting. Okay, so tip number seven, let's think about major events. While the site was here, were there any major events that happened, like a fire or an earthquake or maybe a war? They don't have to all be negative either. Maybe there was a major celebration or a competition of some kind. What traces would those major events leave behind at your ruins? I haven't worked any into this build, but it's something to keep in mind as you go, particularly if you're building sites that lasted for a long period of time, like a castle or something. 
Okay, so we're coming up on tip number eight, and I can hear you asking, when are we gonna actually ruin this site? So far, we've been doing a lot of building. We haven't been doing a whole lot of ruining. The short answer to your question is just now with tip eight. But before we do, I want to just clarify something. There are a lot of tips in this video, and it probably feels like this is going to take forever. Number one, using these tips will make your ruins feel ancient, and players will be able to get a really strong sense of history and sense of place from what you have built. So I I definitely recommend at least thinking about each of these tips as you go. But as you build more and more ruins, you'll become really familiar with all of these things and you won't need to go step by step or you won't need to do each tip individually every single time you build a ruin. Soon you're just going to have these things running through your head simultaneously as you make your ruins and you'll be able to jump between them as you go to tell the story that you're trying to tell. Basically, it might seem like a lot right now, but stick with it because you'll get really fast with practice. So tip number eight is the first of our tips that talk about ruining this site. And this one is all about abandonment. What led to people leaving the site? Did people just move on because the hype faded? Maybe the road changed to go past a castle or a fort or something and now relatively few people come this way? Maybe the people here couldn't gather the resources that they needed to survive, so they moved on. Or maybe one of those major events happened, like a flood or a fire or a war, and people felt that leaving was easier than trying to repair the place. Think about why your site was abandoned and try to build in some indication of that event that people could find. Here, I'm going to say that the tree started to die. Maybe there was some kind of disease that started to poison the trunk and the leaves started to fall. People lost interest in the tree because the tree started dying and so they stopped coming to the inn. It can be as simple as that or it can be more complicated. It's entirely up to you. And connected to this tip, as you're thinking about what led to the site being abandoned, it's also a good idea to think about how long people were at the site. How much time passed between when my inn was first built, for example, and when the inn was abandoned. If it was only a few years, that's going to be very different to it being several centuries, for example, so that can really affect your build. Moving on to tip number nine, now that we have thought about when the site was abandoned and why the site was abandoned, tip number nine is to take away the things that people would have brought with them when they left. People don't generally just drop everything and leave, right? They usually tend, when somebody moves, right? When you move, you take your belongings and you pack them into boxes and then you bring them to the house that you're moving to. Think about how, how much time people had to leave your site. Did they only have a few minutes to grab what they could, like many people might in a natural disaster? Or was it a slower process where they moved out over a few days or even a few weeks? How did they travel away from the site? Could they only take what they could carry? Or did they have a horse? or a mule, or maybe even a wagon with them to carry things. If you want to use Minecraft inventory systems, did they have access to shulker boxes or ender chests, or could they only carry the things they could fit inside their inventory? Once you have a sense of what they could carry away with them and how much time they had to prepare, start destroying or mining the things that they would have taken with them. I'm thinking the innkeeper here had time to plan their move, and they could use a wagon to help carry the most valuable things. They wouldn't be able to carry everything, obviously, but they would take the things that might be valuable to them or things that might be difficult to replace in your head canon of this site, like the beds or the curtains or the books, those kinds of things. It's also important to think about what they might leave behind intentionally. I haven't removed anything from the tree, for example, because there is meaning to that tree and that meaning is significant enough that the innkeeper wouldn't feel comfortable just taking things away. So now we've gone through building up the site and we've gone through the abandonment of the site. Now we're getting into the things that happened to the site after it was abandoned. Once sites are abandoned, they don't just exist in a bubble where nothing happens to them between then and when we happen to stumble upon it. Instead, lots and lots of things end up affecting the site over the years or centuries until we find it. And the rest of these tips are going to focus on those. Also, just as an aside, if you're enjoying this video or it's really helping you think about building ruins in a new way, hit the like button and maybe consider subscribing. I'm going to have more videos about how to build specific types of ruins in the future, so stay tuned. 
So as we move on to tip number 10, I also just want to point out that the first nine tips have a general order to them. You don't necessarily have to go through them in order, but they have a nice flow to them. The rest of these tips, tips 10 through 17, because I have a lot of things to say about building ruins, apparently. <laughs> the rest of these tips can be done in any order and you can hop back and forth between them. The order I'm presenting them in is just the order that I happen to think of them myself. Okay, so tip number 10 is to think about environmental changes or damage. We've talked about major weather events a bit already, and those can happen while the site was in use, but they also happen after the site was abandoned. So were there any floods or hurricanes or forest fires, tornadoes, monsoons? Were there any droughts or blizzards or earthquakes at this site after it was abandoned? Think about how those might have affected the site and build it as much as you can. And this isn't just limited to major weather events. This can also be, you know, relatively mild weather weather events over a long period of time. If a site exists in an area where it rains a lot, like where I live in Scotland, then that site is going to be affected by that rain over time, even if there were never any floods, for example. And also, just as a little extra little bonus tip connected to this, major weather events are super visible in archaeology because they have major effects on the site. That's a really good thing if you want one of these events to be visible to anyone visiting your ruins, but it also means that having more than one of them might confuse people in terms of that story that you're wanting to tell. So really think about that story and choose maybe one or two of these environmental events to chuck in there if you want. Unless, of course, you want to have a whole mess of natural disasters because that's your story. And if that's the case, I mean, like, go wild. Tip number 11 is to think about human influence at the site. Just because people have abandoned the site, that doesn't mean that no person ever comes here again. In fact, in archaeology, we often see people return to major sites from an area's past to use it in some new way for themselves. You can also see this in Minecraft's ancient cities, where a campsite clearly shows that someone other than you came down here to check things out, who wasn't a part of the original society that built this ancient city. People might be traveling and need somewhere with walls and maybe a roof to spend the night, or they might return to the place they or a relative grew up even if it's been abandoned. Or people a few centuries later might find these ruins and decide to bury something or someone here. Also, not everyone who finds this site is here for some great significance or meaning. Maybe they see the glass in the windows and window glass is difficult to get a hold of in your story. It certainly was in reality. So they take as much of the window glass left behind as they can because, you know, that, that saves them a lot of money. Maybe they like some of the stones in the floor or maybe the stable here has a lot of decent building materials. People across time have lifted things like stones or planks or all, all manner of things from archeological sites because the materials are already shaped, already carved, or because there's a cool decoration on something that they want to put above the door to their house, for example. Now, just to say, I'm just going to be clear, lifting stuff from archaeological sites today is generally illegal across the world, so don't do it. But since Minecraft is a video game, basically whatever reason you can think of for someone going to the site is fair game for your story. Tip number 12 is to think about animals. Animals exist in the world, profound, I know, but you might be surprised to learn learn how much they can affect ruins. Rabbits or foxes make burrows and dens in the ruins of buildings, and they drag in dirt or leaves or straw or, at least for predators, things like animal carcasses that leave bones around the place. And don't just think about mammals. Birds love to nest in ruins, and there are sites here in Scotland that are protected from excavation at certain times of the year because endangered species of birds nest there. Also think about the amphibians and the reptiles and oh my goodness, the insects, spiders and ants and beetles. Did you know that there are certain types of beetle that love to live in straw? So we can often identify places like barns or refuse piles in archaeology because of the beetles that are there. And you may be thinking, Archaeoplays, insects can't affect a site that badly, they're so small. And I... Well, firstly, I'm just going to remind you that termites exist, so wood is absolutely affected by lots of insects. But also, did you know that when people visit ruins in real life, like when tourists go to visit an archaeological site, if they're eating food as they walk along the stone or brick path, which happens in a lot of places, that the crumbs from that food inevitably fall into the cracks between bricks or stones, and then ants move along those cracks to get the food, and the damage ants cause to these paths as they try to pick up the crumbs that tourists have dropped on the road is a serious concern for archaeology in many places. 
ants. <laughs> ants cause a lot of damage. So nothing is too small to cause significant damage at an archaeological site. Tip number 13, we've thought about the environment, we've thought about humans, we've thought about animals, now it's time to think about plants and fungi. Plants and fungi affect archaeological ruins massively. In fact, if you live somewhere rather damp, you're probably very aware that plants and fungi affect buildings people are currently living in and using, let alone buildings that have long since been abandoned. Lichens and mosses grow quickly in many places, and they love to cling to stones and bits of old wood. Mushrooms will pop up in many places where it's relatively shaded and cool, and they'll soon dot the ground around your ruin if you're in a good biome for it. If you're in a desert or mesa, you might have cacti or tumbleweeds popping up in places. In other places, grasses and flowers and ferns will grow around the ruins, and trees and bushes will begin to grow really anywhere they can, including like on top of and through the walls of, of, a, of a site. And they can cause some serious damage to the structure as well. So have a think about the biome that you're in and add in some plants around that make sense for your biome. Tip number 14 is decay. So we've, we've thought a lot about all of the things that can affect this site, but at the end of the day, over time, things eventually just decay. And different materials decay or, or erode or corrode at different rates, right? So cloth might decay much faster than wood, which decays much faster than stone erodes, for example. Eventually things break down. They come loose, they fall, or they even disintegrate into traces of what used to be there. This is probably going to be one of the more destructive phases of your build, taking away basically everything that you don't want visible at the end. We are also going to bury the site, so this isn't necessarily everything that you don't want visible at the end, but it's it, this is where you define what shape the actual structure of your ruins is going to take. But as I said, stuff doesn't just disappear, it falls, it tumbles, it collapses. As you're going around your build, look at the walls and the ceilings and the roofs. If you don't want that roof to be there in the end, you can just destroy it, or you can take pieces of it and place it on the ground a bit haphazardly, as if that bit of the roof has fallen down. You don't have to do this with every single piece of the roof, in fact I'd recommend not doing it with every single piece of the roof, but taking maybe like 30 to 50% of it and chucking it on the ground can make for a really interesting element to your site. So think of the weight of each of your structure's elements and what the main supports, like your walls or columns and things, could reasonably hold before they would buckle under the pressure. As I go through these tips, and particularly this one, you might notice that I'm undoing a lot of what I did in previous stages, and that's okay. Some stuff you'll just decide you don't want in the final product, like maybe you've got, you know, you had a bird's nest somewhere, but actually you'd really like a tree to be growing there, so you swap it out for a tree. But if you do want a certain element, like a bird's nest, or a spider web, or a mushroom, or something in that spot, Take it out, make the changes that you're going to make to the structure, and then add that element back in in the area where it makes sense. Tip number 15 is something that you might not have thought of before, and that is to change the colors of your build. Not all of them necessarily, but think about changing the colors in certain places. Materials get bleached by the sun, or become sodden in the rain, and then mold turns them into a bit of a black or brown mess. Colors fade, and in archaeology we often don't see structures in the exact colors they were built in. So as the wood sits here and decays, maybe it turns a darker color, or maybe it bleaches a bit and turns a lighter color. You can change some of the logs or planks as you go, but maybe leave others that weren't as affected by the damp or the sun, so you can see how the color starts to change across the site. I know I sort of complicated things by using warped wood in my roof, and this would be way easier to demonstrate with like spruce and dark oak wood, but the warped wood roof was too pretty, so I'm making it decay into crimson wood. If it works for your story, then it works here. Things like wool carpets and banners and such will turn to a bit of a muddy brown, although you may opt for also like a bit of a mossy green if you want to go a slightly different route with those colors. And here's a tip that I don't think I've seen anybody really do. Window glass generally changes color as it ages, or more specifically, clear glass made from sand generally changes color as it gets exposed to the sun. Copper is not the only thing that oxidizes, window glass also oxidizes. 
So believe it or not, glass made from sand is not automatically clear. Trace amounts of iron and copper that are in the sand color the glass so that it ends up being like a pale yellow, a pale green, a pale blue, or even a bit of a brownish color. It wasn't really possible to remove those trace amounts of iron and copper in the past, so people had to find another way to make what we would call clear glass. To do that, they added trace amounts of manganese to the mix. Manganese in even very small amounts will turn glass a deep magenta-y purple-y color. But since the glass was often naturally a pale green because of those traces of iron and copper in the sand, then trace amounts of pink slash magenta from manganese cancels out the green color to human eyes and we see the glass as clear. But as glass that was made clear with manganese gets exposed to the sun, usually over many centuries, the manganese begins to oxidize and turns the glass purple over time. That's why if you've ever been in a very old building with the original glass in the windows, those panes of glass will be various shades of pink and purple rather than clear. It was never pink or purple in the past, it was clear in the past, but now it's reacted enough with the sunlight to turn pink and purple. So as you go around your structure, you may want to think of where the sun will hit your former windows and swap out any clear glass you have for purple in areas that get lots of sunlight and maybe swap clear for magenta or even pink glass in areas that get less sunlight. And now we can finally get to tip number 16, which is burying the site. All archaeological sites have some degree of dirt or sand or soil that has accumulated since the site was abandoned. Different sites will get buried at different rates in different areas, so if you're in a desert that gets sandstorms, for example, your site might be far more buried in sand or might get buried far faster than a site that is on top of a mountain with relatively little dirt around. You can just use whatever dirt type you have in your biome, so dirt or sand or red sand or gravel, that kind of stuff. Or you can try to make different layers to show some stratigraphy like I mentioned in my video talking about archaeology in Minecraft. I really like using soul soil and brown concrete powder for alternative dirt layers or gray or light gray concrete powder in a gravelly area. The sandy biomes are a touch harder because the concrete powders are quite bright and we don't really have other stuff that is similar color to sand or red sand that is obviously not like people building something. You could work in something that isn't a soil type like stripped oak logs, but as I said, you'd have to make it really clear to people that that isn't part of the original structure, so you might end up just wanting to skip it. And finally, last but absolutely not least, tip number 17, think about excavation and preservation. This probably could go with the human activity tip, but it's kind of a separate thing. Has anyone tried to understand what happened here already? Did they excavate part of the site or maybe even turn the whole site into something that people can walk around and visit? What would they have uncovered and what elements would they want to emphasize? Also, what elements haven't they uncovered yet? It's also important to think about what areas would be off limits to visitors for health and safety reasons, for example, or which areas would be off limits to protect the structure or the site. Also, remember that people in the future, or I guess people in the nearer past to when the structure was abandoned, they don't have to get everything right in their interpretation of the site. We all know that I used oxidized copper here from the beginning, but future archaeologists might just see the traces of oxidized copper in the soil and think that they must have used regular copper when they built it and then the copper oxidized over time. So that's, that's pretty much it. At this point, you have your ruins. I know that building them up and then breaking them down is a long process, but I promise that with practice, you'll be running through all of these tips in your head as you build and it will go a lot faster. So now I'm curious, what are you gonna build? Let me know in the comments or tag me on Twitter with your screenshots. Also, in my video looking at the trail ruins in the 1.20 snapshots, I mentioned that I can see how each block got to where it is. And after watching this video, you probably can too. Check it out and let me know how many you can spot. That's all from me for today. Thank you all for tuning in, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Bye!